you who carry the responsibility of oversight of coursework, programming, or professional training, our hope is that each of you will leave this presentation with new ideas to help you center equity in your evaluative efforts. So to begin, we also wanna give some context for our work. So the Child Welfare Research and Training Project, or CWRTP, uh, exists as a contract between two very large institutions, Iowa State University and the Iowa Department of Human Services. And this contract has been in place since 1988. Um, so the screen illustrates where our contracts exist within ISU and the groups within the Iowa Department of Human Services we work with. So my working title is Facilitator Liaison on the Service Training Contract. Um, our contract works in collaboration with the Bureau of Service Training and Support to provide foundational training to new child welfare social workers and ongoing training for more uh, seasoned staff. So throughout the year, I work with DHS trainers and community-based subject matter experts to build and update curriculum and oversee quality assurance efforts for the training program. And I'll toss it to Ashley to talk a little bit about the work that she does. All right, so my role under the CPPC contract is coordinating two learning exchanges focused on having courageous conversations about race. The first is Race, the Power of an Illusion, or RPI, which focuses on building capacity to reduce disproportionality and disparity in the Iowa child welfare system by examining our institutions, policies, and practices. The other is Understanding Implicit Racial Bias, or UIRB, which allows participants to explore their own beliefs and attitudes about bias and how it affects our attitudes, beliefs, and our behaviors. So both are referred to as learning exchanges because there is an interchange of learning by the facilitators and the participants. However, they can be defined as trainings as well. So they are full day learning opportunities and are available to DHS workers, service providers, or any other person in the community who is wanting to expand their learning and become more acquainted in talking about race. So I'm gonna share a little bit more about RPI and UIRB later, but I want to shift focus just slightly and share with you the why behind the Learning Outcomes Improvement Plan by giving you some context and historical background. So as with the development of most evaluation tools, it begins with what the data tells us. Specifically, we looked at the data in Iowa's child welfare system, and this included examining disproportionate representation of children of color in the system, as well as the disparate outcomes. And so for the purposes of today's presentation, disproportionality is referring to that entry into the child welfare system by a certain population, while disparity is that length of stay within the system because of the inequitable treatment and services provided to them. So the next three slides are going to provide you just a snapshot in time of some of the key data points. And the slides are specific to race, but the data has also been disaggregated by ethnicity and those slides are included in your handouts. So each slide is going to um, show data from the past five fiscal years. And here we're seeing the statewide child population by race. For the most part, population has remained fairly consistent with a slight increase for the African American and two or more races group. As we can transition to the next slide, I want you to keep in mind that in FY21, though, the population of African American children was 7.3% of the total population. So here we're showing the rate that child abuse allegations were accepted. And once accepted, this is what actually initiates a child abuse investigation beginning. I want to emphasize information about race is not collected until the time the investigation actually begins. So this data we're looking at represents disproportionality or again, that entry into the system. And specifically looking again at FY21, Remember that African-American children made up only 7.3% of the total population, but they were twice as likely to have abuse allegations accepted. This is disproportionate representation. And so now I wanna show you a disparate outcome with regards to foster care, that would be a service. So here we are seeing the percent of children in foster care within a given year. Again, I want you to look at FY21 African-American children were twice as likely to be placed in foster care. So these are just two really quick examples of how disproportionality and disparity show up in the child welfare system. There are several more data sets we could share, but in the interest of time, we're gonna direct you back to your handouts. 
And the purpose of sharing these data points with you was just to show the inequities in child welfare, which then is what led us to start asking the question of how do we improve these outcomes? This begins with centering the equity work and examining the quality of training and learning within our workforce that will then have a direct impact on the outcomes for the children and families that we're working with. So although these data slides only reference the past five years, the work being done in Iowa to keep equity at the center of child welfare practice has been ongoing for over a decade. The Cultural Equity Alliance or Alliance is the statewide steering committee championing the efforts to reduce disproportionate and disparate outcomes for children of color. In 2016, upon the recommendations of the Alliance, DHS adopted the 15 guiding principles for cultural equity as a framework for moving the equity focus efforts forward. A list of the guiding principles along with the vision and mission of the Alliance is also included in your handouts. So these guiding principles are now incorporated into the Alliance strategic plan. And as seen on the slide, strategy one focuses on recruitment, promotion and support of a culturally and linguistically diverse workforce that in turn is responsive to the populations being served. A committed group of Alliance members are tasked with overseeing this strategy and they are known as Team A. And I happen to be a part of that team. So one objective of the strategy is reviewing the training curricula offered to child welfare staff to ensure the development of cultural competency. RPI and UIRB learning exchanges are available to promote both cultural competency and skill development. Again, during these learning exchanges, participants practice having courageous conversations about race. They explore how our practices, policies, and national values have created the racial hierarchies that we see. And really, participants should be leaving with an understanding of how implicit racial bias is formed and the influence it has on our decision making, which in turn has an impact on those we serve. So while race, the power of an illusion and understanding implicit racial bias are culturally specific trainings, it was also recognized there was a need for a more formalized process for expanding learning outcomes improvement efforts that also included an, included an equity lens for all trainings. So these efforts would include establishing quality learning objectives in curricula, improving course alignment, and also assessing and building trainer capacity in order to strengthen training delivery. It was determined that every training should encourage critical thinking, increase awareness of personal bias and systemic inequities, and provide workers with the tools and skills they need to provide effective and equitable services to the families that they work with. So ISU staff and Alliance members began researching equity lens options. And what was found was there were training evaluations and best practice approaches to addressing equity that did exist, but they were siloed or separate from one another. There needed to be a more tailored approach instead of tools that married both objectives and would be easily applied to training within the child welfare workforce. This is what led to the formation of an equity-centered continuous quality improvement process being developed. So the diagram on the next slide is going to show the marriage of this process. And I'm going to turn it back over to Virginia to talk a little bit more about that. So this diagram really provides a visualization of the relationship between the Cultural Equity Alliance strategic plan and the continuous quality improvement work taking place on the service. So the LOIP and equity lens was really born out of a convergence of these two equity focused goals that Ashley just explained. Um, so when we began this process, we really were certain of two things. One, we needed a method by which we could formalize our continuous quality improvement efforts. And two, we needed to intentionally center issues relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI as it's commonly referred to, in the social worker training program. Um, we also knew that our small work group did not necessarily know all there was to know about how to specifically accomplish this task. Um, so given this, we really committed ourselves to an iterative process that was rooted in research and informed by those with more lived experience and professional expertise regarding best practice and equity education. So this chart really illustrates the basic flow of this iterative process. Uh, we began with research, we drafted our tools and processes, we presented our work to various focus groups, 
redrafted, met with more focus groups, and now we really find ourselves at the beginning of the implementation phase. Um, I will say we fully expect the iterative process to continue during and beyond the implementation phase, uh, really as we learn more about what works and what doesn't as we move from theory into practice. So the development process began with some foundational research. Uh, here our efforts focused on determining what tools and structures already existed, how applicable those may be to our training program, where gaps existed within those tools, and really figuring out what we would need to design ourselves. So as Ashley mentioned, many of the options available were more siloed in their structure than we had anticipated. Uh, we found many options for pedagogical evaluation, such as broadly used evaluative standards, core competencies of teaching and training, that kind of thing. Um, and we found a lot of solid guidance on best practices for addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion in educational settings. Um, but at this point, we really did determine that we would need to design our own tools to best fit the needs of our training program. Um, so we identified four core evaluative categories around which we would build those tools. So that uh, those categories were accessible design and delivery, quality content that's applicable to the work, effective management of instructional time and effective engagement of learners. Uh, one of the evaluative models we built our tools around is the Kirkpatrick model of training evaluation. So the model is comprised of four levels, reaction, learning, behavior, and results. And with each level, evaluation really drills down to examine more closely the impact of a training initiative. So beginning at the top at the reaction level, evaluation examines the initial impression of the learner. So uh, perceived quality of the content, learner's impression of the trainer, the usefulness of the training materials, et cetera. Uh, this data is often captured through post-training surveys completed immediately following a session. At the learning level, evaluation examines how much information learners absorbed as a result of the training. So this is typically measured through pre and post-test scores. At the behavior level, we begin to examine how learners change their approach or practice based on the training that they've received. So this could be measured through surveys that ask the learner to reflect on how they've shifted their behavior on the job in the weeks or months following training. And finally, at the results level, we really step back to examine how a training initiative affects outcomes at the organizational level. So this could include um, impacts to service outcomes for clients. So what uh, the data that Ashley began the presentation with, um, worker retention, agency-wide processes, et cetera. Uh, and this level really is often the most complex and long term of the evaluative process, as you see. So with all of this research in mind, we began drafting tools uh, and formalizing how all of the different methods by which we were evaluating a training fed into and informed one another, really in order to ensure that the learning outcomes improvement plan flowed well and was as streamlined as possible. So using the Kirkpatrick model as our foundation, we listed the data available to us and started formalizing our evaluative strategies. So this is a lot. Um, so let's begin by just looking at the reaction level. Uh, we began by identifying the components of our evaluative process that best match on to this level. So this included immediate feedback from participants, trainers, hosts, and any guest speakers involved in a training. Within participant feedback specifically, we focused on data such as participants' likelihood to recommend a training to appear in their position, as well as how applicable a training was to their work. So throughout the LOIP, we focused on closing and shortening feedback loops, and this work was especially important at this level of the model. So in the month following each session, qualitative analysis is performed on the feedback data collected, and then recommendations are provided to the trainers in the form of a monthly summative feedback report it's really meant to aid them in making small adjustments to their delivery or content. At the learning level, our plan focuses on analysis of pre and post test scores. So for example, uh, we conduct an annual comprehensive review of our three foundational courses for new social work case managers and child protective workers. So these are the folks that do investigations. Um, within this comprehensive report, we examine whether workers who completed each foundational trainings are achieving the learning objectives for each course and that's done through a detailed comparative analysis of pre and post test data. We have begun to build in evaluation at the behavior level for some of our courses within uh, the follow up surveys that we conduct. So these surveys um, or within these surveys, we ask participants to again reflect on the same prompts they were asked immediately following training. So the items like their perception of the applicability of the training content their likelihood to recommend the training. Um, and this is done to examine whether going back into the field has shifted their perception of the training over time. 
In addition to these items, learners are asked a series of open-ended questions that align specifically with the course objectives and really seek to measure shifts in professional practice 30 to 60 days after training. Uh, I will note that these follow-up surveys are currently only conducted for a small subset of our courses. So our view at this level is somewhat limited at this time. Um, the results level of the model, we're not currently able to evaluate within our LOIP, um, but we do hope to expand our analysis of both the behavior and results level more in the coming years. So as we previously mentioned throughout this process, uh, we've really been careful to close and shorten those feedback loops. So when viewed in full, uh, you can see now how each component of our evaluative strategy maps onto this model and how the various components inform one another. Uh, for example, feedback collected from learners, trainers, and hosts informs the monthly uh, course reports and summative feedback reports, which in turn inform our annual course review process, and it really serves to substantiate course updates needed for the coming year. Uh, as we went through the focus group process, which we'll talk more about in a moment, uh, we realized it was critical for our equity lens to really be woven through our LOIP rather than function as a standalone tool or checklist. So we identified the touch points within the LOIP that would afford us the best opportunities to implement equity focused efforts at various levels of evaluation. So when gathering participant feedback, when using the training observation rubric, which is included in your handouts, uh, during our annual course review meetings and within our follow-up surveys. So uh, gathering feedback on our tools from experts with both lived and professional experience was really a crucial step in this process. Uh, we know that in order for equity efforts to be effective and lead to lasting change, the work must be collaborative and it must be intentional. Uh, it cannot be a box checked or a weight carried by a single person. Uh, so we began our focus group review process by meeting with the DHS Cultural Equity Alliance Team A uh, that was charged with implementing that strategy one of the Alliance's strategic plan that Ashley referenced. Uh, and then we continued meeting with focus groups as we revised our tools and processes based on the feedback we had received. So on your screen, you will see the groups with whom we conducted focus groups listed in chronological order of those meetings. So this is a brief overview of the early iterations of our LOIP equity lens tools and processes. Uh, while I have already mentioned, it became clear that throughout the process that a simple checklist would not be enough. Uh, it is important to note that that's exactly where we started. Uh, I highlight this because it's important to know that when you start trying, you will inevitably get things wrong. And it's far more important to persist through those missteps uh, and receive feedback with humility than to expect perfection from the beginning. Um, so as you can see, with each iteration, not only did we improve on the drafted tools and processes, we also deepened the evaluative measures built into our tools. So uh, we began to undertake some meta analysis as well, examining whether our evaluative tools themselves were equitable based on the feedback that we received. Uh, for example, are we considering the impact of bias in trainer recruitment uh, and participant feedback? So, the iterative process really led us to the LOIP equity lens we have today that is far more comprehensive. Um, it's comprised of four elements, assessing and building capacity, evaluating training, gathering and responding to feedback, and measuring impact. Um, and Ashley will be covering the practical application of all of these components when she speaks on the implementation phase of our work. Uh, but to start with, I'll guide us through the details of each of these equity lens components. Um, so the first area of focus uh, in this equity lens is assessing and building capacity. So here we're really focused on building the capacity of trainers to teach with equity at the forefront in order for them to then equip participants to work in an equitable manner with children and families. So to accomplish this, we examined our processes from trainer recruitment straight through to the annual course reviews. Uh, we developed five questions or discussion questions to assess uh, the capacity of new trainers regarding their readiness and experience facilitating training with diversity, equity, and inclusion at the forefront. And these questions are detailed on the next slide. They're also included in your handouts. Uh, the initial assessment would be included in the interview process for new contracted trainers uh, brought on in the future and would also be discussed as part of the annual training observation process. Uh, so when uh, focus group uh, feedback identified the importance of assessment being an ongoing process versus a one-time event, we built out multiple avenues for trainer skill and capacity to be evaluated. So to make uh, assessing trainer capacity more objective, we recommend the use of an evidence-based assessment tool such as the Intercultural Development Inventory or IDI. 
This assessment tool uh, allows the person completing it to really better understand their own development as it relates to cultural competency and to also develop an individualized plan to further this development. Uh, trainers will also be given the opportunity to self-assess their level of skill within our training observation rubric, which we'll talk more about in a moment. And then finally, we recommend intentional, uh, behind one click, uh, finally, we recommend intentional co-facilitation for DEI-specific trainings, as this really is a crucial effort by which to increase the capacity of both trainers. Uh, we do recognize the emotional labor expended by people of color who are training staff on diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. So by having one trainer who is a person of color and one trainer who is white, Space is really created for the trainers to support one another in the delivery of the training message. And it also promotes increased engagement with participants. So as we get, begin to unpack topics like white privilege, um, it is likely the message will be received differently by the participants, depending on who's delivering it. So the interview questions for new trainers focus on their experience, readiness, as well as exploring technical assistance that they may need to address DEI within their trainings. Um, as I said, the copy, a copy of these interview questions is included in your handouts. Um, one piece of feedback we received from our focus groups was uh, keep in mind barriers to entry. So some trainers may enter into this space with more personal experience than professional experience relating to their understanding of DEI issues. And that personal experience really should be equally weighted. Um, and Ashley will talk more about uh, the interview process when she discusses the implementation phase of these processes. So the next component of the equity lens focuses on training evaluation. Here, our work centers on uh, ensuring the content and delivery of the training addresses diversity and equity issues, as well as examining whether the design of the training is inclusive of all learners. So the tool we developed was our training observation rubric. Uh, a copy of this tool is included in your handouts for you to review in detail, because there is a lot to it. Um, trainers will receive this rubric ahead of the observation, so the evaluation metrics are transparent, um, and to provide them an opportunity to self-assess their uh, training, design, delivery, and content prior to being observed. So during the observation, a rating of one to three will be given for each item, so one uh, indicating significant improvement is needed, two that there is developing skill, and a rating of three means that the trainer is really highly skilled, or the training uh, is well designed in that area. And then a space is also provided for the rater to provide comments or recommendations uh, that provide additional detail for why a particular rating was given. So the results of this rubric will then be attached to the usual summative feedback report that's provided to the trainer in the month following training, and then will be used to inform changes to the annual course review that kicks off a new fiscal year. Uh, if a trainer has difficulty identifying or incorporating equity-focused content into their trainings, we will, we will ask uh, critical thinking questions really meant to promote consideration of intersectionality. So these questions could be, uh, what disparities exist within this topic? What data may be available that demonstrates these disparities? And then what do workers need to know uh, to address or redress these disparities within their professional practice? Uh, Ijiomo Ulu actually provides excellent discussion prompts in her book, So You Want to Talk About Race. Highly recommend you checking that out if you haven't read it already. Um, these questions uh, include how might race, gender, sexuality, ability, class, or sex impact this subject? So getting a little bit more granular with our questions. Uh, am I shifting some focus and power away from the most privileged in this conversation? And am I providing a safe space for marginalized people to speak out? And how am I doing that? Um, Example questions uh, can, to help folks consider intersectionality is also included in your handouts. So the training observation rubric that we designed uh, includes four categories, course design, instructional management, assessment, and community building. And these categories map on to those best practice evaluative categories that were identified in our research. Uh, so again, we wanted to ensure that the equity lens was woven throughout our tools and processes. Um, so the items listed on this screen are the items that relate to DEI um, or our equity lens specifically. And Ashley will talk about a couple of these items when she breaks down the current implementation phase of the LOIP. So the third component of the equity lens focuses on gathering and responding to feedback. Here we're focused on implementing a responsive process for feedback received outside of formalized channels, such as the course evaluation, as well as ensuring equitable evaluation of our trainers. Um, so to ensure a responsive process for feedback, 
we sought to clarify the institutional processes for reporting concerns relating to discrimination, harassment, or disparate treatment of learners during a training. Uh, we also worked with our counterparts at DHS to develop a feedback process for learner concerns relating to HF802, as we worked to include equity content into all trainings that was fully compliant with this new law. Uh, we understood that not only can uh, personal bias impact the way a topic is framed or trained on, personal bias can also impact how a trainer is evaluated. Um, so this is an example of that meta-analysis I had previously mentioned. Uh, to mitigate the impact of personal bias in training evaluations, we're working to implement a bias awareness statement that will be included in all course evaluations. So the impact of bias awareness statements was actually researched by an ISU faculty member a few years ago. Uh, Dr. David Peterson led a study on the impact of bias awareness statements in mitigating gender bias specifically in student course evaluations. Um, as female instructors do tend to be given a lower rating than their male counterparts. And this was a trend that we were seeing in our own training program. So this study found that when a bias awareness statement was added to a course evaluation, there was a significant positive effect on the evaluations of the overall rating of the instructor and the overall rating of the course. Um, and this was specific for classes led by female faculty. Uh, and the effect of this statement was substantial in magnitude. So as much as half a point on a five point scale. Uh, so the statement on your screen was adapted for our use um, and we're recommending that it precede evaluation questions to ensure that participants are primed with this information before they begin their evaluation. The final element of our equity lens is measuring the impact of our work. So here we're focused on measuring uh, improvements to train our capacity to center equity in training content, design and delivery, and measuring improvements in learner understanding of equity issues, as well as behavioral change in their work with diverse populations. So as we have implemented more equity related learning objectives throughout the training program, we've also focused on expanding uh, DEI related questions in both assessments, so this would be post tests and quizzes, and evaluations, so this would be post training course evaluations, and those follow up surveys that I talked about. And that really allows us to quantify the impact of our work. Uh, we will also be able to quantify uh, the impact of uh, these processes that we're putting in place through a comparative analysis of the results of our training observation rubric uh, and how the course content shifts over time through the annual course review process. Uh, so this slide summarizes the improvements we're working on to quantify the aforementioned assessment uh, and evaluation questions we've been building out throughout the training program. Uh, I'll now pass it to Ashley to talk a little bit uh, more about how we move into the implementation phase. Thank you, Virginia. Um, I will say outside of being a part of a few of those focus groups that she mentioned, I really did not play a direct part in the intricate development of the process. However, I have been able to reap the benefits and rewards of all the work that has gone into um, the development. So the LOIP process has not been fully implemented in all training curricula, but I do wanna highlight a few of the ways we have been able to put the process to use over the past year with the learning exchanges specifically. So first to assess and improve trainer capacity to lead trainings using an equity lens, Virginia mentioned all DHS trainers and ISU support staff completed the intercultural development inventory or that IDI. Once the assessment was completed, the individuals received a customized profile, which provided a blueprint for them to further develop their intercultural competence. The IDI was chosen as the assessment tool to be utilized because of its strong validity and reliability across diverse cultural groups. So as more equity trainers for race of power of an illusion and understanding implicit racial bias are onboarded, the goal will be for each of them to also complete the IDI so that they are able to do their own self exploration of culture. Next, those five discussion questions were incorporated into the interviews when hiring both third party trainers and the equity facilitators. I've conducted many interviews um, before. However, asking these specific questions assisted us in being able to choose the most highly qualified, knowledgeable, and skilled facilitators. This past January, our most recent cohort actually completed their training and began facilitation. Participant evaluation responses are indicating they believe the facilitators demonstrate a thorough knowledge of the subject matter, 
as well as using relevant examples and exercises to enhance the learning process. So it's been really exciting to receive that positive feedback and so early on when we are, we've been using that tool. In addition to asking those uh, discussion questions, we were also very intentional in asking questions that were gender neutral and made sure each candidate was asked the same exact questions. Also, interviews were conducted with two interviewers with different cultural backgrounds to reduce bias affecting our decision making. From the onset of the hiring process and throughout, our goal was to make sure an equity lens was being applied. Currently, we are awaiting DHS approval to incorporate a bias awareness statement into all curriculum. Um, we're not worried that that won't be approved. Um, we do feel it's extremely important to have this clause stated to help mitigate the impact of personal bias when participants are giving feedback on training evaluations. And then finally, we are continuously measuring the impact that processes tools and techniques are having on strengthening our DEI content and improving learner understanding. There are annual reviews that occur for each of the training curricula. However, the training observation rubric is also utilized during each of the learning exchanges and at facilitator work days. Twice a year, all the facilitators gather together to debrief their facilitation experiences and provide and receive positive and constructive feedback from one another. This is also a time for the facilitators to have open discussions about current events as it relates to race. And during these work days, individual curriculum edits are reviewed utilizing the rubric. So this past October, we actually did a review of our understanding implicit racial bias curriculum. And I'm gonna share two areas we determined needed strengthening. So here, um, you are seeing one of the areas on the rubric. So we begin our review of the UIRB curriculum by looking at course design. We determined that the area of thoughtful use of diverse images needed strengthening as we often used cartoon images or inanimate objects. And I'll show you an example here in a sec. We updated those slides with images of real and diverse people. This small but very necessary change helped to humanize the discussion we were having about race and provided more connections between our content and delivery. We also were intentional in choosing images representing diverse communities and those not feeding into stereotypes. We very much understand that representation does matter. So here you are seeing um, a before picture. Um, and it is showing what one of our slides looked like um, before. As you're seeing, there was no human representation at all, which really took away from us being able to connect what we were talking about, in this case, culture humility, and applying it back to working with individuals. So now, this is what the current slide looks like. Just by adding a picture of actual people, we are helping the learners to connect that when working with all people, regardless if they do or do not look like them, they should be taking a cultural humility approach. Even in today's PowerPoint presentation, we hope you notice the thoughtful consideration taken to choose images that reflect diverse communities and elevate or change that perception of marginalized groups. So another way we've used the rubric was examining community building in the area of exploring personal bias. Clearly the core topic of understanding implicit racial bias is implicit bias. And the goal is for participants to walk away with information they can put into practice. We rated ourselves as developing this skill and to move us to that next level of engaging participants in critical thinking, we incorporated more group chat time. And from the onset of the day and throughout, we talk about how once you see implicit bias, either in yourself or others, you can't unsee it. And then it just becomes a matter of if you do something about it. The day concludes with a small group activity where the participants are giving case scenarios and they have to apply the information they've learned throughout the day to decide how they will approach a situation where bias is occurring. The intent of the case scenario exercises is to have participants practice practical application of the learning objectives so they can take this skill back to the field when providing services. 
Each facilitator also comes prepared to share their own personal stories and experiences to emphasize a point, especially when it shows um, our own growth or vulnerability on our journey. This is where having that interracial facilitation is also a benefit because we are making sure to have lived experiences shared from the perspective of a person of color in addition to a white person. So these stories demonstrate how we turn our oops moments because we all have them into teachable moments that we can all learn from. So these are just a few examples of how the LOIP process and rubric have been utilized to enhance the learning exchanges um, from both a facilitator and course content and delivery perspective. And as we continue to utilize the rubric, we expect our training delivery to be strengthened and participants to be able to walk away feeling they have tangible information they can apply to service delivery. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Virginia now and she's gonna be able to highlight what your next steps can be. So we started the session with an aspiration. Uh, you will leave this session with not only ideas, but inspiration to center equity in your evaluative efforts. Uh, we do hope that we've been able to provide you with a few new ideas regarding how you can intentionally center equity in your evaluation of curriculum, programming, or professional training. Uh, as you move forward and begin to design or maybe redesign uh, your evaluative processes, please keep these things in mind. Uh, first, do your research. Identify those tools that already exist and really think critically about where those gaps may exist. Uh, seek feedback from people with different perspectives. Uh, know that you don't know everything uh, and be intentional about seeking feedback from folks uh, whose lived experience is different from your own. Uh, track your progress. Um, identify those objective measurements that will be able to help you assess uh, whether your actions are having the attended effect and lean into iterative processes. Uh, you will get things wrong, but remember that as humans, our brains are best positioned to learn just after we've made a mistake. Uh, so get comfortable with failing forward. So thank you so much for joining today's session. Uh, our contact information is on your screen um, and we'll open it up now to any questions that you may have. Can you all see the questions in Whova or do you want me to read them to you? Oh, if you could please read them. I think we're only yes. seeing chat, so yes. Uh, so there is a question that, well, a statement. Thank you for sharing your process. This is amazing. What advice would you give as departments embark on evaluating undergraduate programs through an equity lens? Ooh, um, I mean, it really, for me, it comes back to those, those four um, bullet points. Um, you know, what has, what has worked, what hasn't worked, um, what research exists that can help you focus specifically on the population that you're trying to teach. Um, Ashley, any thoughts on your end while I kind of pull together any other ideas? Um, no, I, I mean, I think just with any time you're entering into conversations about DEI, equity, race, um, you just need to go in with that humble approach, um, grace for not only others, but definitely for yourself, because like Virginia said, there's going to be moments, and like I said, there's going to be those oops moments, so um, I think that's where people get stuck a lot of times is um, where mistakes come up, or I made, you know, I said something that I shouldn't have, and we've got to be able to get past that. The second uh, question is the book that you mentioned. Can you provide uh, the title and, uh, oh, and she has it. <laughs> so you wanna talk about race. So this, this really is a fantastic book. Um, and there's a whole chapter on intersectionality uh, that comes with discussion prompts. There are also discussion prompts in the back of the book. Um, so yeah, I would highly recommend this. I can pop this in the chat um, in terms of the author's last name as well, um, just so folks have that. And I think it is referenced in the handouts as well. I, be, I was sure to um, put her name in there.
Virginia. I just wanted to uplift the state uh, and Ashley, thank you so much for this. Um, I just wanted to uplift this statement about being in the best place to learn after you make a mistake. And I think that that will help. I think that should help all of us as we either enter into situations and make mistakes or as we witness mistakes um, that we don't back off from those that we're good, we're active, actively um, engaging in that after the mistake is made versus the fragility that we might feel for other people who are making those mistakes. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, totally. It is. It's it's scary because you want to you want to get things right the first time, but that's just impossible because there's always going to be more to learn with any topic. Um, Ashley, what are your thoughts on that? No, I agree with um, what she said there. So thank you for the positive feedback. And um, I really liked and I told Virginia this as we were putting together the presentation where she says, be prepared to uh, what is it fail forward? Yes, yeah, so I really like that concept um, because that is how we learn um, and we grow is by um, by our mistakes. So thank you. We did have another uh, question in the Whova, and that is uh, where are the handouts and materials referenced during the presentation? And they're in Whova, um, just below uh, the presentation window and uh, Virginia and Ashley's uh, pictures. Uh, there are four handouts that are available there for download. Uh, another question has come in, uh, and that is, how can you add restorative justice into this space? Ooh. are asking such good questions it's hard to come up with an answer to that right on the spot um i mean i i guess specifically within the um lens of child welfare um i know some of some of the recent training initiatives that we've had have focused on um meeting parents that maybe have been let down or left out of the process. So uh, parents who are incarcerated, um, fathers in general, um, there's been kind of low, low engagement of fathers. So really focusing training initiatives on um, pulling folks in that have been uh, marginalized to a very great extent um, and maybe uh, have some stigma attached to them in terms of you know, maybe they've caused harm in a domestic violence situation um, or um, because of uh, their presence in um, a prison, they just haven't had access to those services or, or been engaged at the level that they should be. So that's kind of the most specific example I can think of when it comes to restorative justice. Um, yeah, Ashley, anything else that's coming to mind for you? The only thing that I can think of in applying it with that child welfare lens applied, um, there is, and I'm not sure how um, <clears throat> privy people are to the legislation that passed in 2020 with Family First and how uh, child welfare services are delivered um, in a different manner than they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. And I would say it is taking more of that restorative justice approach in the sense of really the family is trying is the one who is navigating how their case is gonna go forward. Um, I think we all know from like motivational interviewing or um, facilitation techniques, really when you're guiding a person to understand why they chose to make a certain decision and they're the ones who are choosing to make a different decision, that's the impact. Um, that's gonna really impact them sustaining that change. And so that's where child welfare is trying to help to mitigate that. Um, those numbers, that data that we were showing you earlier, um, it's still too new to see if Family First and the, the evidence-based practice that's being implemented is going to have an impact on that. But um, it definitely has to play, there has to be race and culture incorporated into that conversation um, and not getting too caught up in cookie cutter approaches, which a lot of times with our, you know, um, criminal system, with all of our systems, we get into that cookie cutter, that it works for this person, it works for this one, but we really need to take that cultural humility approach.
Any other questions we can answer? I know we're kind of running down to the last few minutes. All right, well, I'm going to assume we were able to cover everything. Um, I'm going to kind of shift over to the next slide. So this is the QR code to evaluate this particular session. Um, if something pops up for you, because we did throw an awful lot of information at you, um, if something pops up for you uh, in the coming days or weeks, please feel free to shoot an email to Ashley or I. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, kind of unpack anything that has come up for you uh, after this session ends. But thank you so much for your attention. Um, this was a really great experience for us to be be able to present this information to you and uh, let you know uh, what we've got going on uh, over at CWRTP. So thank you.